So, we have looked at uh, the Ising universality class of uh, systems for which we wrote down a Landau energy functional and from which we got the equilibrium configuration. Now, I would like to do that in a slightly more general context and uh, show what happens when you introduce fluctuations on the one hand and uh, the idea of inhomogeneities on the other and how there will be relaxation to the equilibrium state. So, to recall to you, we begin right away with uh, the order parameter m of r, the magnetization or whatever the order parameter be and if I if you recall the Landau free energy. It is not exactly the Hemmholtz or the Gibbs free energy. We saw that we constructed a functional in such a way that you got the correct equilibrium value above and below the critical temperature. This free energy L, let me just call it L, this is equal to an integral d in d dimensions of R and then the terms inside first of all in the absence of an external field there is no linear term, but if you put in an external field there is of course, a term proportional to that. So, uh, let us put in a field h of r. So, this is minus h of r m of r there is such a term and the next term is a quadratic term, but if you recall it had a coefficient which was proportional to T minus T C. So, that it would give you the right critical behavior. So, that term let me call it A tilde m squared of r and this A tilde is a positive coefficient A times T minus T C over T C which is A times T little t was this uh, difference between you know, this uh, t minus t reduced temperature t minus t c over t c. And in the magnetic case there was no cubic term, but only the fourth order term and the temperature dependence of that term the coefficient was irrelevant. It just had to be positive so that you would have stability about the equilibrium e stable equilibria. So, this was b times m to the power 4 of r and then to include inhomogeneities caused not just by the fact that you have an h of r, but in general you have a term which include gives you the gradient energy when you have inhomogeneities in the magnetization and this was of the form uh, 1 half that half is just for convenience some coefficient times gradient of m of r mod squared. Okay. So, that was uh, the Landau free energy. The equilibrium solution is found by minimizing this free energy. So, equilibrium configuration given by delta L over delta M of R equal to 0. And we also have to ensure that it is a minimum rather than the maximum, but the structure of this makes it clear that it will be a minimum. So, what is that equal to? Well, we use the rule for functional differentiation, make this r prime everywhere and use the fact that uh, the functional derivative of uh, 
m of r with respect to delta m of r prime this is equal to a delta function d dimensional of r minus r prime that is the basic rule. Then of course the only non trivial term is this and I argued that uh, the, the functional derivative of gradient m of r mod squared r prime say divided by delta m of r that is what you are going to have to differentiate out here. So, if you make all these guys r primes Yeah, I need to do the integral as well, but let me look at what is going to happen here. This is going to be twice, so it is going to give you a twice gradient of m of r prime times uh, derivative d, d or whatever it is of r minus r prime times the functional derivative of the gradient itself. But the functional derivative because it is got to be a vector right. So, this is times uh, dot product with uh, delta over delta m of r gradient m of r prime. Okay. And this you do integration by parts. Only one? Oh yes, yes. So you are you're right. The gradient of the delta function. Thank you. Yeah. I I use this gradient with respect to r prime. Yeah. So this is r prime. Okay. But what I really have is an integral over d d r prime. So, really you should insert this d r, uh, r prime on both sides and when you do that and you integrate by parts this delta function is going to fire and this gradient is going to operate on this factor here. So, you got a del dot del and then you have uh, del squared there is already a half so it just gives you minus del square ok. So, let us cut that short and write this whole rule as uh, delta over. So, uh, once you put that in we can write the solution down. So, let us just do that. So, this configuration is given by minus I want to write this uh, properly. So, 2 a tilde m of r prime plus 4 b m cubed of r sorry the r everything is r r prime is gone minus h of r minus uh, c del squared m of r equal to 0 that is the equilibrium configuration. So, it is a solution to a partial differential equation in space like the Schrodinger equation, but there is a non-linearity here there is an inhomogeneous term which is not uh, serious. But if you had just this term it would be nice be linear, but unfortunately there is this non-linearity okay, which you cannot get away from. So, the equation the thing from to the from the start it is obviously a non-equilibrium situation yeah, a non-linear situation ok. All right. Now, let us suppose we have solved this in principle and now I ask the following question if there is a local fluctuation say due to thermal noise from this equilibrium configuration 
how does the system come back to it? So this is now in the spirit of uh, our old friend linear response theory and we would like to find out what is the way the relaxation is going to proceed. Okay. And now there is no rigorous way of doing this except in a specific model but you would guess the following exactly as we did in the very naive Langevin equation case you would guess the following you would say well a good assumption would be to say okay for a given configuration delta L over delta M I am not going to write all the arguments this quantity is 0 in equilibrium and away from equilibrium for a non equilibrium configuration this measures the deviation from the equilibrium. So a good way to find out what the relaxation is like a good guess is to say delta over delta T a configuration M of R relaxes to equilibrium by minus this times a constant times this deviation from the equilibrium. So that is a relaxation equation typical relaxation equation exactly in the same spirit as we saw relaxation occurs in the Langevin equation or in the Boltzmann equation etc. Hmm. But there is no guarantee that you give a configuration it does not relax to a local minimum. So in general once you give me an equilibrium configuration of this solved by this there are local maxima and minima and there is presumably a global minimum which is the thermodynamic equilibrium state. But if you give me a model of this kind with some initial condition configuration there is no guarantee that it does not tend to a local minimum and stick there. That does not happen in actual practice because if you plot this m as a function of uh, configuration variable it might have this kind of behavior and you if you start here you might relax simply to this point whereas you really have a thermodynamic equilibrium state over there. So it is clear there must be some fluctuations which take you out of these local wells and put you into the global minimum. Therefore to this you must add a noise term which mimics the effect of fluctuations. But this noise must itself be inhomogeneous because the function of R because you have got an order parameter which is a function of R now. So it is a field plus eta of R and So this is thermal noise. And this is exactly the structure of a nonlinear Langevin equation. But nonlinear. Okay. So its solution is formidable because you have a stochastic differential equation for a field, and it's got nonlinearities it is space dependent so it is a partial differential equation space and time derivatives and on top of it you have non-linearities. So it is formidable and the only way you can make any headway with it is by functional integration methods. But we need to specify what sort of noise. So we make the simplest assumption that it is uncorrelated Gaussian noise. So we will start by making this assumption that eta of r and t over all realizations of this noise over all realizations we will say that it is got assume that it is got 0 average hmm? and moreover and here is a crucial assumption eta of r t eta of r prime t prime over all realizations this is proportional to delta functions. So we assume that the noise is uncorrelated at different time uh, points and at different times. So this is equal to some constant 2d delta of r minus r prime delta of t minus t prime 
in d dimensions of course. Okay. This is not so obvious and I am slurring over certain technicalities here. For instance, if you have what is called a non-conserved order parameter, then this is no longer true and consistency demands that you should put uh, del squared over here acting on the delta function. But in the magnetization case that does not apply, so this is okay as it stands. Mm -hmm. Then we need to specify the probability distribution of this eta. So, what would one do? You would assume that the distribution of eta, so let me call it p sub eta, the probability, yeah. What is conservation in an order parameter? Ah, this is not a quote unquote dissipative order parameter, it is magnetization unlike for example concentration that relaxes to an equilibrium configuration but there is no conservation of total magnetic moment or any such thing. Okay. So there are two classes of problems and if time permits I will mention the other class but in this case this is a consistent thing here. Okay. So you have P of eta of some configuration M of R of eta of r comma t this probability is proportional to e to the power minus some variance and because you got a 2d here you need to have a 4d out here integral d d of r eta squared of R and T. Okay. So, that is the probability distribution of it is a Gaussian probability distribution generalized to a field. This constant of proportionality whatever is out here is a normalization. So, the volume will appear. The it will be a functional integral over all etas. So, there would this uh, there will be some constant and k inverse goes like integral well d eta e to the minus whatever it is 1 over 4 d integral etc. Okay. So, I am not going to get into we will not try to normalize that we just need the assumption that it is a Gaussian here okay. which means you in principle know all the joint probability distributions as well. Once you make this assumption that it is delta correlated, it is like noise. This is the sort of uh, uh, spatial space dependent extension of white noise that we did in the Langevin equation. Okay. And we are now talking about the probability distribution of whole configurations of eta at every point r for a given for each given t. Then, not surprisingly one can actually write down a corresponding Fokker-Planck equation because we need to know what is the probability distribution of M, what is the probability distribution of the configurations M of R at any time t given this. So, it is the old question exactly that we, the same as what we solved in the case of the ordinary Langevin equation. Given a Langevin equation, the statistics of this eta, the fact that it is Gaussian etc. How do you get the Fokker-Planck equation from it? Now, I just made the statement that we have a, in, the, in the original in the other case that we have a Fokker-Planck equation, we looked at its equilibrium and so on, but one can make this a little more rigorous. One can make this um, one can do that fairly easily as follows and we want to do this in this functional case. So, let us go about it in the following way. This quantity must obviously be equal to by definition the expectation value of a delta function, a generalized delta function of m of r t minus m of r for a given configuration minus the m that you get 
from the Langevin equation. So, let me write it as m l e by solving the Langevin equation for each value of the noise, each realization of the noise and then averaging over all noise realizations. So, if I call that m l e this is a function of r and t over eta. In other words the average is of this delta function oh, we weighted with p sub eta. That is by definition the, the probability distribution of this configuration in m. Okay. Where m l e of r and t equal to m l e of r and 0 you give me the initial configuration and then you have to solve this equation. So, it is just minus gamma times integral 0 to t d t prime delta l. This is what I give. There is no need for L e. It is whatever initial configuration you give minus delta L over delta n. I will not write the argument here plus integral 0 to t d t prime eta of r t prime. that is the formal solution. Of course, this quantity here involves that derivative with, res of, with respect to L. So, that is a formidable nonlinear object, but in so it is not a solution, it is just a representation of this M L E and you have to put that. So, everywhere here in bracket the argument is M L E in a self consistent way of course. So, I should really mark the argument this is L of m l e. Okay. And then I have to take this delta function multiply it by p of eta and integrate over all realizations sum over all realizations right. So, that is the way one would do this and you of course, start by saying look we do not write the solution down I find the derivative of this with respect to time. So, I am going to head towards the Fokker Planck equation and for that I need the derivative with respect to time that will give me a derivative of this quantity. So, it is a theta function to start with and then there is going to be a derivative of this. So, all the t dependence is sitting here right. and for this quantity I go back and use of course, the Langevin equation. So, that is the way you derive the Lange Fokker Planck equation for a given Langevin equation even in the ordinary case the finite degrees of freedom case. So, the sum and substance is that you end up with the following Fokker Planck equation. So, you have delta over delta t p p m of a configuration. at any time t this quantity is equal to not surprisingly not surprisingly you are going to get gamma times uh, integral d d of r prime times gamma times that is the drift term. There was a minus sign in the Langevin equation and remember in the drift term you get another minus sign. So, that gives you a plus out here plus and the way we have normalized this with the 2 d here you have to do 1 over this guy. So, this becomes uh, plus d 
times delta p m or delta m. Okay. So, there is a second derivative term because the noise in this case is not multiplicative, it is got pure delta functions, no r dependence here by assumption. So, it is d times that which is what you expect plus this guy here this is the drift term. The only difference is it is not linear, this thing is completely crazy, it is not li linear equation at all. But we can write down what is the equilibrium value, what is going to be the equilibrium distribution that is found by putting this equal to 0 which is equivalent to putting this equal to 0. So, the solution, the equilibrium solution, let us write it down. the equilibrium configuration, it is not a function of time, this fellow is obviously apart from normalization constant, it is e to the minus gamma over d because essentially it is equating this to 0. Right? So, it is e to the minus gamma over d times uh, integral d d r prime of r let us say the function of r here. I am a little confused here because of the notation. Should not it be delta L by L? No, it will be L because I want to check if this equation is valid or not right. I mean so, if we just do this with the constant component. It is just going to be L, yeah. it is just L yes. right because if I differentiate it I am going to get delta L over delta M here once. Right. But we would like it to be the Boltzmann distribution. Right. Remember this is the energy density and you are going to have to integrate to get the full land of energy. So, it is of the form e to the minus whatever the energy, but we would like it to be the Boltzmann. So, this goes to the Boltzmann distribution which goes like e to the minus integral d d l minus 1 over k Boltzmann t provided d equal to gamma k t. That is the fluctuation dissipation theorem, right. That provides a consistency check, okay. I am sorry for using the same symbol d that we used for diffusion in the position space earlier. This is the diffusion in the velocity space, the analog of that, uh, because uh, it is uh, the Fokker Planck equation for the analog of the velocity. If you recall what that was uh, way back when, it was mv dot uh, plus m gamma v equal to this force eta of t, and we assumed a strength capital gamma for this guy here. So, we assume that eta of t, eta of t prime was equal to gamma delta of t minus t prime and then we got gamma as 2 little m gamma k t. But more important, remember the Fokker Planck equation for it, we had delta of p of v t over delta t equal to gamma times delta over delta v. V p plus gamma k t over m d 2 p over d v 2. So, this was the diffusion constant in uh, velocity space. Now, the m has essentially been put equal to 1, there is no m sitting here. So, it is not surprising that you get d. Capital gamma plays the role of d, capital D here plays the role of gamma. Okay. 
So that is that is the way the consistency thing works out ok. So we have some idea. The key statement here is that uh, there exists an L from which that equation is coming. Exactly. That is the bottom. Line. Exactly. So there is a specific L we model this L we took care of the m square term, the m4 term, the gradient energy term etcetera such that you get the correct equilibrium distribution and we impose this uh, condition here. Now the next question is to ask how does it relax, how does it relax to equilibrium? That is a harder question because you really have to go back and ask look at the Langevin equation itself but that is a harder question however one can do the following. Can you linearize around? One can linearize exactly. So we are going to assume so relaxation to equilibrium and let us do this in this simple case when T is greater than T C. Because then M equilibrium of R this guy is equal to 0. I use this for the average itself so right. I should really put brackets here because I have used this M in the Langevin equation without putting brackets but ok let us be rigorous this quantity is 0 right ok. So we write an equation for this M if I go back to the Langevin equation I have uh, delta M over delta T this quantity a little bit away from equilibrium is equal to minus gamma delta L over delta M which is equal to minus gamma and now you have to tell me what all those terms were. There was uh, minus there was a minus C del squared M. So let us do it in the absence of uh, an external field. Plus 2 A tilde M plus A tilde M plus there was a 4 B M cubed I am going to throw this out. right we are taking average values I am not going to indicate it, indicate it specially everywhere there is average so the eta term has gone away. So this is equal to gamma C del squared M plus uh, 2 A I am unhappy with the sign minus 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 gamma okay. because there is a del square term here and this m is space dependent the obvious thing to do is to resolve it into Fourier modes take a Fourier transform. Let us let me put a tilde for the Fourier transform here. So it says delta m tilde over delta t for a given k, yeah. okay. So this is uh, Fourier. with respect to the space variable r spatial Fourier transform this fellow is minus 2 gamma a tilde m tilde and then this is going to give me a k squared the del squared with a minus sign 
So, there is going to be minus uh, gamma c k squared and I pull out the m tilde. Right. I do a Fourier transform here, I am going to get a minus k squared because it is i k the whole squared and this is a m tilde. Okay. So, this quantity is equal to leaving out the nonlinear term. So, for small deviations from equilibrium, the linearized equation gives me this. Incidentally, this uh, Langevin equation. The, this relaxation equation, the full nonlinear relaxation equation, is called the time dependent Ginzburg Landau equation in super when applied to superconductivity. So, just this alone with the full nonlinearity is the time dependent Ginzburg Landau equation. And then you add to it the noise term, it becomes a stochastic differential equation and it helps you to analyze the way fluctuations lead to uh, state of equilibrium. In principle within this model, it tells you everything about the time dependent uh, uh, magnetic configurations. If you include the external field, then, then it tells you in principle everything. Okay. But whether the original assumption this is valid or not is a different question. It is clearly reasonable and plausible sufficiently close to equilibrium because you are saying the rate at which it relaxes to equilibrium is proportional to the deviation from the equilibrium. It is in it is absolutely a linear response the statement just like uh, fixed law for diffusion or heat conduction etcetera. It is a it is a linear response statement. Linear in the field it is linear in the field, not, not linear in the variable, not, not in the order parameter no, but it is linear in the field and that is what linear response does right. Okay. So, in, in particular it will give you some statement about the susceptibility because remember the susceptibility is the derivative of the order parameter with respect to the field at 0 field. So, this thing is equal to minus m tilde over tau of k where the relaxation time is given by relaxation time tau of k is given by 1 over tau of k equal to 1 over tau of 0 that is this term plus gamma c k square. Right? Tau of 0 by definition this quantity here is 2 gamma a tilde. So, the infinite wavelength or k equal to 0, the uniform background configuration relaxes at this rate with tau of 0. But this is equal to 2 gamma a times t, little the, I should not use t, it is t minus t c over t c. And as t goes to tc, this goes to 0. So, 1 over tau 0 goes to 0 and therefore, tau 0 goes to infinity. That is called critical slowing down. So, this is where critical slowing down comes. Huh? So, let us write that down. Then remember we are in T c greater than T greater than T c we started with that assumption. So, 
it diverges goes to infinity implies critical for k not equal to 0. So, finite wavelength fluctuations even at the critical point will be ok, they will relax with the finite time, they go like k squared, 1 over tau k goes like k squared, okay. but as long as k this thing is 0, if k is 0 then you have a divergence of the relaxation time, but the finite fellows do not do that okay, which is reasonable it is only the infinite long wavelength overall background mode that makes it, that gets slowed down. Okay. The shorter wavelength ones will have finite relaxation time because those are controlled by this quantity. As this becomes larger it, the, this is finite and therefore you have finite relaxation time. Okay. So, this uh, helps us formulate it is a start of something called dynamic scaling, the dynamic scaling hypothesis. Now, what we have therefore is the following and from here. Yeah, the static exponents will get related, now we will see when you have, so let me call it dynamic scaling. So, look at what tau k did tau of k it went like t now let, let, let me use t for t minus t c over t c. For a minute okay. there is no time appearing explicitly anyway in this formula so it should not confuse this goes like t to the minus y y equal to 1 for k equal to 0 right and it went like uh, k to the power minus z these are standard symbols z equal to 1 uh, 2 for t equal to 0 at the critical point the other modes the 1 over the 1 over tau k was exactly proportional to k squared and therefore tau k is proportional to k to the minus 2 okay so we have introduced two new exponents y and z out here now both these can be subsumed in one relationship by again making a hypothesis that at the critical point this guy here is some power multiply and, and that close to the critical point this guy is some power law in little t multiplied by a scaling function exactly in the spirit of Widom scaling right and then experiment will have to tell you if that is correct or not ok. So, one hypothesizes that tau of k goes like t to the power minus y that is this in general even when this kind of simple mean field theory is not valid multiplied by some function of k times the correlation length the old order parameter correlation length to the which is a function of little t and now we need to get these two from it out here for that you require since so let me let me let me write this fellow as in the critical region t to the minus y phi of k times t to the minus nu apart from some constants because this diverges like t with this exponent nu if you recall which was one half in mean field theory right. So, how is this going to be reconciled with that? If you put k equal to 0, you should have this divergence here, which is this term here already, provided phi of 0 is finite. So, we require of this function phi, 
phi of 0 must be finite and non-zero some finite constant. But as t goes to 0, this guy goes to 0, you want this behavior. That means this thing must be cancelled out with the t to the power y. So we want phi of uh, whatever its argument, phi of uh, x let us say, phi of x, phi at x equal to 0 must be finite and phi at x tends to infinity must go like x to the power uh, minus y over nu. Right? Because then this term will go like this will then go to t to the power minus y k to the power minus y over nu t to the power minus nu to the power minus y over nu which will give me a t to the y which cancels this and gives me a 1 over k to the y over nu. Huh? So this goes like k to the power minus z where z equal to y over nu. Because remember we wanted k to the minus z. So it is a simple trick, it is the same trick being played all over again that you have two different limits then it forces the scaling function to have this behavior. That is the only way in which you can be consistent here. So this will immediately imply or y equal to z nu. So this implies that this tau k goes like t to the power minus z nu phi of k t to the minus nu. So we have introduced a dynamic scaling exponent z, there is one more exponent here. Now we can relate this to the susceptibility because what you need is the formula the susceptibility chi t, now we do a Fourier transform of uh, k omega. This fellow here is the derivative of m tilde in Fourier transformed in space and time and average taken with respect to delta h tilde of k. So we can now write and we know that there is a gamma here, an exponent gamma a divergence near t equal to 0 for the static susceptibility. Right? So once again we can make a statement about the dynamic susceptibility, make a generalized scaling hypothesis here. So essentially you will have to assume that this fellow here is some power of t, little t multiplied by a function of k xi and omega tau naught where tau naught is this thing uh, the k equal to 0 relaxation time right and that turns out to give you relationship between this dynamic exponent and the other exponents okay and so on. Now this whole business can actually be generalized to a much more general class of problems including the way uh, th this is the beginning of the dynamic scaling theory which is now applied to a very large number of problems both in and out of a close to equilibrium and far away from equilibrium such as the growth of surfaces, spinodal decomposition etc. etc. Okay. So the wide variety the trick is again the scaling. I have not talked this is the starting point of the renormalization group approach to critical phenomena which is where this comes into full play the power of these scaling arguments okay. and you can rigorously show what the relations are between various scaling exponents, what the upper and lower critical dimensionalities are, what the nature of the critical point is in every case etcetera. Okay. This Z out here 
see it's uh, we got all these static exponents by looking at just uh, trying to we got relations yes when we tried to write everything in terms of the objects which came from the correlation length right right so now what we are doing is we have got from this thing we have got something which is relating correlation length Yes, Wait to correlation time. time. Exactly. So Z exactly. Is, I need only one more. Extra. Exactly. So that's that's the whole point. Well, once we have a relation like that, we got rid of this intermediate thing y, and we already know nu, and the time behavior is given. This uh, thing here will tell you what uh, the so dynamics is. With suitable modifications, with Z, uh, yeah, with suitable that. definitions of Z, etc. Yeah, the power of this whole thing is not apparent here because unless we do the renormalization group, which is another way of saying that you use scale invariance near the critical point, the system becomes scale independent. All fluctuations on all length scales and time scales become equally important, and the trick was as opposed to the original ways of tackling equilibrium statistical mechanical problems where you try to solve or trace over a fine partition function you trace over all degrees of freedom simultaneously this divides and conquers. So, it breaks things up depending on the k value or the wavelength of the fluctuations integrates over variables which either vary slowly or you know or very very or long period times uh, long uh, spatial extent and then or the other way about and then ask for a case uh, uh, up, up impose the condition that the system will look scale invariant on all scales. So, that forces you to have certain relationships between various uh, exponents among other things right. It also gives you a calculational method of computing systematically uh, computing critical exponents outside the framework of uh, mean field theory. Okay. I use the symbol y and z here although in the, in the case we have looked at y was 1 and z was 2, but the whole idea is that you hypothesize that these exponents can have different values other than these values here okay. and indeed they do. There is a closely related related to this Langevin equation there is another one for growth of uh, random surfaces growth by aggregation for instance called the KPZ equation the Kardar Parisi Zang equation which again is like the diffusion equation with a noise term added to it. Okay. We saw the original diffusion equation was for a probability distribution, but now we are seeing this noise added to a diffusion equation itself in the same spirit as this, this is already partial differential equations and on that we added noise a similar kind of approach there. That leads to so called roughening exponents and similar uh, results ok. So, I think I will uh, stop here with this topic and uh, refer you to some text for the rest ok. There are a couple of interest, uh, good textbooks on this many many good textbooks on critical phenomena, but I will write out a list of these. Uh, into uh, useful books and give it okay.